Welcome to this special edition of The Journey Home, The Journey Home Roundtable. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi. We envision these roundtables as special gatherings of former Journey Home guests who come from, in this case, different backgrounds on a topic. And we've done one of these roundtables on baptism. This particular roundtable discussion is on the Eucharist. What does it mean? And for this episode of the roundtable, I've invited back the same panel that uh, discussed baptism because in that sense, because of the different traditions we come from, both of these sacraments or ordinances went through the same kinds of shifts mm -hmm. in the Reformation history mm -hmm. that led to our backgrounds. And so we have with us in this round table, Father Gray Bean, welcome back, former Baptist minister, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sean Reeves, former non-denominational independent Christian, and Noah Lett, former Lutheran pastor, welcome back. And my background, uh, though I was brought up Lutheran, I was a former Presbyterian Calvinist. So we share, therefore, four different perspectives this time on the Eucharist. But as I've done in previous roundtables, I'd like to invite each of you to give a little snippet, reminder of your journey of faith, that the audience can get the full story if they go to the religious catalog and get the old Journey Home program. That's Father, right. Father well, I, I said recently that my conversion to the Catholic faith can, can be summed up in two words, church history. And, <laughs> and it was really the discovery of historical Christianity and reading about the early church, particularly the first five centuries of Christianity, as I think back on it, that really had a very profound impact on me and opened my heart and my mind to the truths of the Catholic faith. Mm. And so I could say it was really church history. Uh, and, and at first it was more of an intellectual conversion. But then through the reality of the Eucharist, which we will talk about today, the Eucharist was what got into my heart because of course the Eucharist is the Lord Jesus himself. And so that was, that was what caught, the, the reality of the Eucharist is what caused my heart conversion. But it was really church history it brought yeah. me over. Just to make sure our audience doesn't miss the fact that because you've summarized it, you, you had already had a deep surrender oh, to absolutely, Jesus. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that was very much the trajectory of mm -hmm. your life mm -hmm. and ministry and the discovery of history was a rediscovering of That's what right. Christ had taught and intended. Would you have said there that Newman's statement had to become deep in history as it ceased to be Protestant? Oh, absolutely. It's a summary of your journey. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. All right, mm -hmm. thank you. Sean. If Father Bean is going to summarize his uh, journey in two words, church history. I'll also summarize mine in two words, the Latin word sola scriptura, which mm -hmm. um, means uh, scripture alone, the, the, the notion that scripture is the sole authority. Um, because of a doctrinal crisis I went through when my church at home split over an issue uh, of baptism in my college years, it, it thrust me into this, this chaos where I really didn't know what to believe anymore, what is true. And through that searching, I realized all these different denominations are all looking at the same scriptures and coming to different conclusions. So how do I work beyond that? Because I had such reverence for the scriptures that I needed some way to have clarity as to what they are really proclaiming to me. And it came to my mind that the only way that can really transpire is with some extra biblical authority that works in conjunction with the scriptures, yeah. that is united with the scriptures, that can show us what the scriptures really are conveying to us and what they are not. Um, I also read many of the church fathers in that, in that yeah. search, delved deeper into scripture, um, and eventually led me to the Catholic Church. All right. Thank you. I, my story is not two words, it's a, a lifetime. <laughs> like without my, par my parents were not Christian in any sense, didn't have any faith to give me. For the first 17 years of my life, I did never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. I was six or seven years of age when I'd heard a story of Solomon um, and his dream and his request for wisdom, and a voice prompted me to ask the same. I asked for wisdom, and I became aware of the need to answer the question, what makes existence worthwhile? Those, uh, those from age six or seven to the age of 17, I searched for an answer, basically through the 60s with no access to clergy, scholars, or anything, because there was nobody in my family that had church background. So met Christ on the telephone out of the blue, which is a providential moment with, met Christ. He gave me the reason to live. I live for you. I knew that. I still live by that. But then there was the need to learn about what it was to follow Christ. Mm -hmm. Next day after I had been converted on the telephone by hearing about Jesus having what he said was amazing, but it's not a story. He, I 
The next day I was fully aware that I'd been born again, that Christ was in my heart. And I asked my friend who converted me, what do we do now? He said, we read the Bible. I was so ignorant. I was so ignorant. <laughs> and I simply followed on, went to college. In college, learned lots of things. Eventually learned something that made me choose for a denomination, which was Lutheranism. Uh, and it had to do with the Eucharist, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. When I joined the Lutheran Church, I was very aware that it was a step to something, but I didn't know to what. Very distinct. I still remember it. Eventually, in New York City, I'm a Lutheran pastor, and I have this encounter with St. Bernadette and uh, our Lord, where they asked me three questions, and, and uh, at the end of which I realized that the Lutheran works of the altar were not the, the altar of the Catholic Church, and I needed to lay it down. And, be, and I became Roman Catholic at that moment and joined the Catholic Church uh, later on when I went to Ohio from New York City with my family. Since I want to take part in the panel, not just as a host, but as representative of the Calvinist perspective, let me give a little bit of my background. Uh, I was brought up Lutheran, mm -hmm. And I suppose in a way I represent those who come through the main line conveyor belt of a traditional church. I went through all the things that a young Lutheran would go through. In fact, I remember Lutheran worship and I, I still know the day, the words to the liturgy. Mm -hmm. And can remember celebrating the Lord's Supper once a Sunday as a young Lutheran, taking part in that because of baptism and confirmation and the whole nine yards. Uh, but like so many who come through the system of mainline churches, I got a lot of information. But it didn't sink that distance from head to heart. When I left high school, I left the faith behind. I didn't think it was necessary. I went through three years of college without any active involvement in my faith. Very caught up in scientific materialism until I had that conversion to Jesus, mm -hmm. which changed my life. 180 degrees, mm -hmm. and to this day, I'm still desiring to serve him with my heart, mind, and soul. Eventually that led into seminary, went to non-denominational, interdenominational, evangelical seminary, where I was first ordained congregationalist, but or then quickly ordained Presbyterian because I had been convinced in the Calvinist perspective, the covenant perspective and understanding of Scripture, believed that the Bible was the sole foundation for our faith, as did all the rest of my seminary brothers and sisters. Served as a pastor for about nine years, teaching basically modern Calvinism, mm. an evangelical slant, mm. celebrating the Lord's Supper once a Sunday, as all the rest of us did. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the midst of that, the issue that opened my heart to the issue was that I knew lots of people that agreed that the Bible was the infallible, inspired Word of God, the sole foundation for our faith, yet we all taught different things. I had a Presbyterian slant, good buddy Baptist, had a different understanding, Methodist, Church of Christ, Assembly of God, Pentecostal, a Charismatic, Episcopal, Catholic, you name it. We all believe in the val validity of Scripture, but why did we come up with different conclusions? That struggle eventually led me out of the pastorate. I assumed the problem was me, not the Bible until I met an old seminary friend named Scott Hahn, who had become a Catholic. He introduced me to Catholic teaching, and I recognized that the Bible was never intended to be the sole foundation of our faith. It is a part of sacred tradition that we've received from the apostles through the church. And that eventually, many other things, as we all could share our story longer, led my wife and I into the church. And as a result of that conversion, uh, I now help other Protestant ministers come into the church through the Coming Home Network, but also had this great privilege through Mother Angelica to host these kinds of programs. We share four different perspectives. Baptist, non-denominational, Lutheran, and Calvinist, Presbyterian. Our subject is the Eucharist, mm -hmm. which is, we talked about baptism on a previous program. Mm -hmm. Our views of the Eucharist are drastically different, mm -hmm. also because of these same backgrounds. Historically, let's begin with you, Noah, because it was Luther yes. that started the whole ball rolling that caused the, the crisis. How, in fact, how did you understand it as a Lutheran, and how did it connect with Luther's view of uh -huh. the Eucharist? Um, my personal discovery was the Emmaus Road story where I was reading about it, and just at the point where it says he gave it to them, I suddenly realized that the bread and wine were the body and blood of Jesus Christ. I had no prior view. I didn't have a view. I read it there and it, I said it. This was before you became a pastor. Before I became, became a pastor. A Lutheran. That's right. I suddenly realized it's the body and blood of Jesus. I didn't know how, but I knew that it was. 
And I, at this point, realized I needed to associate myself with liturgical groups, Lutheran, Catholic, uh, Anglican, and, and Orthodox. And I worked it down to Lutheran and Catholic, and I looked up the Lutherans and asked them to talk to me. And uh, I had one class in Luther. I decided to become Lutheran, as I said, but I realized it was a step to something else. When I got into Lutheranism, I began to discern that their view of, Lu of the Eucharist was not the view that I had personally discovered uh, when I was reading the Emmaus Road story. They, they, Luther had this view that the, Jesus is with, in, with, under, and through the elements. The elements never change to become Jesus Christ. And why he did that is because he started with this philosophy of, he started with this view that was entirely exegetical, confessional. He, did, he wanted to affirm what scripture said without giving explanations because he didn't like scholastic explanations that were being given by the church. He didn't like the, philos the philosophy that had been the foundation for much of the faith for Correct. centuries before right. him. He adopted a philosophy in doing that, but he rejected the philosophy that had been yeah. the basis for the explanations. So he has this in, with, under, and through, the elements never change. So Luther's view is varied. Sometimes you'll see him say, if you drop the precious blood, you need to clean it up because it's Jesus. At other times, he'll tell you, oh, just leave it there, it's nothing. You know, the guy's not insane, he just is unable, he doesn't want to go into explanation, he doesn't want to assert that the bread and wine become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Lutherans today, who don't mind Luther at all, <laughs> will read the scriptures and they'll have an, an understanding that more predisposes them to the Catholic view. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I know many Lutherans who believe themselves in exactly the way Catholics do, even though it doesn't connect with their Lutheran tradition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we end up amongst Lutherans with a great ver variety of views. But Luther's view was very close to the Catholic view. He fought with the other reformers to hold, this is my body, he yes. yelled at one point with the other reformers. Confessing what the scriptures say. Mm -hmm. yes. This is my body, but where he wanted to go with it was different. Mm -hmm. My background as a Presbyterian pastor, Calvinist, um, Again, my, I was more of an evangelical Presbyterian, kind of a modern Presbyterian, so my view wasn't strictly Calvinist, but Calvin had this struggle in a movement even farther than Luther, with an emphasis on the sovereignty of God, what God declares is true. Now, we're not going to go into the nominalist philosophies behind both Luther and Calvin, mm -hmm. but this idea of God can do anything he wants to do, mm -hmm. but what has he chosen to do? And then also the struggle with what we perceive when we celebrate this. So we ended up with this struggle between what really happens and what we experience. And essentially we end up with what's called a spiritual mm. Eucharist. Christ is very present in a real and unique way when we celebrate the Eucharist, when we remember mm -hmm. what he did, but it, nothing changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. It remains bread and wine or bread and juice or whatever we used. So there was this mystery, and depending on what tradition of Calvinist Presbyterian did you come, you emphasize the mystery. Right. I don't know of any, and I'm, I might be wrong, I don't know of any Calvinists that have a view close to even Luther, mm -hmm. that believe that something really changes, but they yet might believe that grace is received in a unique way mm -hmm. in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, mm -hmm. in a way that that's why we have to do it once a month or maybe more often, but there's the other extreme of some Calvinists that mean it's merely a remembrance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of what happened because of that view. And so you have a great variety of views amongst Calvinists. They have difficulty then explaining how Christ is present at the Eucharist in a way different than say at prayer by your bedside. Because it's spiritual. There's no substantial change that takes place. Yeah. In fact I remember in my Presbyterian church once a year we would have an all night prayer vigil for some purpose. Uh, in other words to support missions or uh, I happen to have a very faithful evangelical Presbyterian church and so we would be pro-life. But I remember when I had the stint of 3.30 in the morning because no one wanted to sign up for that and there I was in the church by myself praying at 3.30 in the morning. I remember as a Presbyterian pastor thinking, why am I here? Mm -hmm. 
Why am I in this building? Yeah. There's nothing different. Why can't I be home in my study praying at 3.30 in the morning? Why am I making everybody come here? Well, it's, this is the church. This is where we gather. But there was no sense of the unique presence of Christ here because of the Eucharist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was merely symbolic. This is where we gathered for worship. Mm-hmm. How about the Baptist? Now later again, all this argument between Luther and Farrell and Zwingli and Calvin, out of the midst of these folk, there was also the Baptist view which mm-hmm. arose. Very similar to what you have described. Uh, the Southern Baptist Church, especially uh, recently, I'd say within the last several decades, uh, has moved towards a more Calvinist perspective. In fact, I can, the, the seminary I attended was very strong on what we would call five-point Calvinism. You know, these five <laughs> points of doctrine like that's right. within Calvinism. I was and a four-and-a-half pointer myself. Yeah, okay, but that's, yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs> but we, we, we believe certainly that, uh, as Noah described, there was no difference between the presence of Jesus, if I pray personally at home, and the presence of Jesus there in what we would have called the Lord's Supper. Right. Again, we would have never used the term Eucharist. Right. Yeah. In fact, mm-hmm. I had never even heard of the term Eucharist until I began to study church history in my 20s. I had never even heard of the word before. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we had three ordinances, baptism, marriage, and Lord's Supper. Uh, and we, I don't even know that I would say we believed in a symbolic presence in the Lord's Supper because uh, we didn't really think that the bread and the wine or actually the bread and the grape juice, (laughs) was important at all. But that the presence of Jesus was there um, because of the faith, I guess you could say, of the people who were there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that we celebrated Lord's Supper, first of all, because Jesus said to do it. You know, we felt that was very important, that Jesus said, do this in memory of me, and so I, I guess we should do it. Secondly, as a way of remembering that unique and special moment, in the life of Jesus. Um, But as far as any kind of special presence of Jesus there, unique presence, or anything actually happening to the elements, the bread and the wine, no, absolutely not. There was no change there. In fact, I can remember the church I was in, after we finished up the Lord's Supper, we would let the children in the church there uh, finish off the grape juice because, you know, we didn't want to keep it. And so the kids would finish it off and, and because, we, because we didn't believe in any kind of special presence or any change in the elements. So it was totally um, a spiritual reality. And I don't guess we would have believed that you got grace from it either. I, it, you know, I, 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 interesting, our similar backgrounds. In my small country Presbyterian churches, the, the, the women would bake the bread right. for the communion. Mm-hmm. And often they would bake a really nice loaf. The others they'd cut up but in little squares, but they would bake a nice loaf for the pastor right. to use as the visible symbol of the remembrance. Mm-hmm. And then I got the bread when it was done to right. take home for lunch. <laughs> right. And I remember that God said, the first time I did this as a young pastor, I'm nervous. First time I'm up there and the ladies had put the bread on the table for me to do that. And you know, I'm all, I'm, I'm nervous about it. So I'm saying the words of, you know, the night when Jesus betrayed, he took bread and I went to pick it up with one hand. Well, the ladies had already sliced it so that it would bring a nice clean break. Half of it broke off hit the table, bounced onto the, uh, onto the sanctuary, and I just kept going. He did not drop the bread. He picked it, you know, went, but the point was, it never crossed my mind that there was anything wrong with the body of blood, the body of Christ hitting the floor, right. or that, you know, it, right. because of my tradition, it never crossed right. my mind. And, and not that, and, and in my tradition, it was, it was an important thing. It was done with great solemnity right. and seriousness and... And, uh, and, 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 the, and the church I attended, we believed that a person had to have received baptism. Had to, you had to be a professing Christian yeah. to take part in the Lord's Supper. So it wasn't an unimportant thing. Right. We weren't frivolous about it. It was very important to us. But, but there was no reality of Jesus there in, right. the, in the Which is interesting. Point. I'm going to go back to that question, the fact that some of us, even though we didn't believe that anything really changed, right. yet had closed communion. That's right. We'll talk about that maybe in a little bit. What about your background, Sean? Well, as a non-denominational, I was not taught that there was any actual physical presence of Christ, nor any spiritual presence of Christ, much like Father Bean here. Mm -hmm. Um, It was something that was symbolic. It was a commemoration of of an event that took place. 
Um, although interestingly enough, you, you, you look in your past and you see these little hints of, of God slowly tugging you toward the Catholic Church. I remember about, I was about 11 or 12, and um, I took very seriously the words because the, the pastor would recite the words, this is my body, this is my blood, and pass around the, the little pieces of bread and the little things of grape juice. And I remember being afraid to chew the bread because even though at that point in time I had not been well taught in that tradition, I, I heard those words periodically and took them seriously. Now, later on in my teenage years, I was you know, taught better from that perspective um, to be more in line with what they believed and, and, and realize that they believed that it was just symbolic. And so that was, in a sense, conditioned out of me. And I became very staunchly um, uh, tied to the notion of just being symbolic. But then that made me wonder, well, why are we doing this at all? Um, because it was something that, in your traditions, I don't know how often you did it, but we didn't do it very often at all, maybe you know, once or twice a month, um, if that. Um, and it became aware to me that, um, uh, or I became aware that it was more of a fellowship. We didn't refer to it as Eucharist right. either. It was more, it, we referred right. to it as communion. Yeah. But it was not an emphasis on communion with Christ so much as communion with one another and commemoration that we believe that this event took place and had significance. It is interesting, uh, before we take a break, to address the issue of even though our traditions had different views on the Eucharist, on the Lord's Supper, we would, none of us probably, maybe met, uh, Lutherans may have called it Eucharist, but I know that I mm -hmm. never did, that some of us have our tradition of closed communion, though, mm -hmm. which is very interesting. It, closed communion. Um, can you think back in your history of where you've come from, why there would have been closed communion? I will say that for a while I served as the pastor of a Church of Scotland mm -hmm. in Cambridge, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. that only celebrated the Lord's Supper once a year for a week. Once a year. That, that tradition came from the Covenanters in Scotland. And they had a very strict closed mm -hmm. table you had to have a little chit to get in. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't have that, you didn't receive the communion. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost a little bit works righteousness mm -hmm. connected. Mm -hmm. What about the closed communions in your history? Did, did right. the Baptists have to? L L Lord's Supper in our tradition was only for uh, what we would call a mature Christian. In other words, a person who had accepted the Lord Jesus and who was living for the Lord and who understood the importance of the Lord's Supper. So therefore, we took it seriously, but uh, for instance, someone who, who just came in off the street or a little child, you know, we would never let an un, a, a little kid who hadn't made a profession of faith take Lord's Supper because that was only for people who had made a profession of faith and who were considered to be mature. Because the Lord's Christians. Supper wasn't a channel of grace, no. it wasn't something, but because it was an intellectual understanding of what it right. was. Right. And, and really, I mean, even though we, we would have not called it that, it really was a rite. Yeah. Uh, uh, sort of like a rite of passage in our church that we received yeah. it quarterly, four times a year. And you knew you were in when you were old enough to receive the Lord's Supper because I can remember how excited I was as a young person when my mother and father finally said, you know, well, now this Sunday we're going to have Lord's Supper and you can, you can receive the Lord's Supper now. This was not something that was experienced in, in, in my background. It was open to everybody. Okay. There was no concept of blocking anybody off from community life. Um, so to read something like St. Justin Martyr's uh, first apology where he says, you ought not to receive the Eucharist if you don't believe the faith we do and you have not been washed by, by the waters of regeneration, <laughs> that would have been appalling to, to my mentors and, and to my community. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lutherans were, contemporary Lutherans have a variety of positions on it. Some closed, some not. Generally, I would say they're not closed. Right. I never met a Lutheran guy that said, you know, I stopped the person because they weren't a member of my congregation, they were off the street, and I didn't know who they were. I never met one who said that, and we have conversations where you could hear that. So my general understanding is that it's generally open. Now, Luther himself, um, there was, it was more closed because he's still protected by the cultural elements of his time, but as that Catholic culture diminishes, you in the, have the questions that are raised here. Well, how can you exclude anyone? As the faith becomes more subjective, how can you exclude anyone? Can you read their mind, you know? <laughs> All right, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, I'll have the panel discuss how Scripture, as well as the early church fathers, awakened their ideas.
their thinking and their practice towards the Catholic position. We'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> Welcome back to our special Journey Home Roundtable discussing the Eucharist. Our panel, Father Gray Bean and Sean Reeves, Noel Latt, and myself, Marcus Grodi, come from different traditions mm -hmm. in understandings of the Lord's Supper Eucharist. Sean, let's begin with you. Talk about the transition. What started awakening your thinking and your practice to a more Catholic understanding of the Eucharist? Sure. In, in terms of the Eucharist, my, my journey really began with a combination of study of the Church Fathers, particularly the very early Church Fathers, um, and, and Scripture. I remember the, first, the very first passage I ever read of any of the Apostolic Fathers, or any of the Church Fathers for the first five centuries um, at all, was from Ignatius of Antioch's letter to the Church in Smyrna, where he said, be wary of those who do not confess the Eucharist to be the flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ. Flesh that was sacrificed for us and that the Father raised again. And that struck fear in me because I recognize here's a man writing in the turn of the second century between 100 and 110 um, AD and he's saying that there are a group of people who do not believe in the real presence of Christ and you ought not associate with them. You ought not believe what, what they proclaim. Um, and I was afraid because at that point in time you know, the, the Catholic Church was the only church I knew of at that point in time that really held that kind of a theology, and I didn't want to be Catholic at that <laughs> point in time. Um, but here's a person who, now I did not know at the time he was writing against the Docetists, who did not believe in the presence of Christ in the Eucharist because they didn't believe, they didn't believe it could become the flesh because they didn't believe Christ had flesh that it could become, that he was solely divine and did not take a real human nature. But it really caused me to investigate even deeper what the scriptures say, because here, here's a man who's probably influenced by John the, ba or, um, John the Apostle, um, very early church, and he's a historical representation at that time of what people in the church believed. It was well before I thought that anyone would have taken that notion. I had been taught that, you know, basically the Council of Nicaea and, and, and Constantine Catholicized the church and changed their doctrine, and the very early church really believed what my church believed, that, that the Eucharist was symbolic, purely. Um, so I began looking at, at passages like John chapter 6 where, where Jesus says, um, unless you eat of, of my flesh, you have no life within you. And this was so important that the, some of the disciples left and said, this is too hard of a teaching. <laughs> and he didn't turn around and say, hey, let me explain better. You know, I'm, I'm just speaking metaphorically here. He said, go. You, know, you have to believe this. And then he turned to the apostles, those people who would be the leaders of his church, those people who would be his representatives on earth, his ambassadors. Um, who would bring his presence to others. And he said, do you want to leave also? And Peter says, where would we go? You have the words of everlasting life. So it was so important that he made sure that those people who would proclaim his gospel really understood this, and he did not leave it at, at confusion. But also, um, in the 10th chapter of Paul's letters to the 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul is writing against those who would participate in idolatrous activity. And his, his premise of why they ought not do this, which he said he comes to say is, is a partaking in demons, is a participation in, in, in demon worship, if you will, is he says, um, the cup of blessing which we bless, in verse 16, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The, the bread that we be break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? And this word participation in the original Greek is, is koinonia, which is sometimes translated as, as, as fellowship, mm -hmm. which gives an idea of friendship and camaraderie, but the word itself really Participation is a good translation because it really means a tangible union with. Mm. So he's right. saying that you ought not participate in, in idolatrous uh, rites because you're, you're uniting yourself with demon worship. But the reason he said this, the, the way he backed this up is said, because we already know that we participate in the blood of Christ in the Eucharist. We participate in the body of Christ in the Eucharist. That it brings us in a tangible union with the blood. It's not it's not a tangible union with, with some spiritual essence of Christ. He says it's a union with the blood. 
Mm. It's a union with the bread. It's a participation mm. in that. Mm. And that was fascinating to me. That was, that mm. was momentous. Mm. Wow. Father. Well, of course, as a, as a Southern Baptist, I was always taught that the Scripture is interpreted literally. And so one of my early struggles was when you would read, like, for instance, the Last Supper narrative from Take Luke's Gospel, which we read in Luke chapter 22, verse 19. Then he took the bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which will be given for you. Do this in memory of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which will be shed for you. And uh, I had always been taught, you, you interpret the scripture literally. What it says is what it means, except this. <laughs> and uh, I, I struggled with that. Now, I have to say, uh, as, I, as I said earlier, the, my conversion to the Catholic faith was initially an intellectual conversion. And the Eucharist was the last piece to fall into place for me because it's really, if you, if you think about it, the teaching of the Catholic Church on the Eucharist is an incredible thing. Mm -hmm. And my thinking at that point, at a certain point in my life was either this is really the Lord Jesus Christ or this is the greatest satanic deception and the greatest idolatry mm. that has ever been foisted on the human race because here you have a whole church that is worshiping a piece of bread. Yes. And so <laughs> yes. I'd reached a point in my life to where I realized it's either got to be the Lord or it's got to be false. And if that's false, then it seems to me that the Catholic Church should be rejected mm -hmm. if the Eucharist is false. Um, and really and truly my final conversion, if you will, to the Eucharistic Jesus. And it was, I think it, for me, it was a really a, a conversion to the Eucharistic Jesus. Was uh, reading John chapter 6, which I had read many times before. <laughs> but at this particular moment, it was a graced moment, I would say. I saw the words in a new light. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life mm -hmm. within you. And then how many of the disciples fell away from the Lord over this teaching. And I remember the day that I read that and it pierced my heart. And the Lord spoke to me as if saying, you believe all these other things and yet you will not take me at my word on this important issue. <laughs> And, and so that was a really a point of conversion to me, was belief in the Eucharist. And uh, at that moment, I had a deep, deep desire to receive the Lord in that way. And, and so for me, it was really taking the Gospels in particular seriously. That when, that when Jesus said these things, he really meant it. <laughs> He, he wasn't just using fanciful language or metaphor that, that when he said, this is my body, this is my blood. And the other, the other part of it for me was seeing it as a participation in a Passover. That um, since I couldn't be at the cross 2,000 years ago, through my participation in the body and blood of Jesus in the Eucharist, the cross comes to me. Mm -hmm. And that was very important mm -hmm. for me as a Baptist, um, to be able to participate in the saving action of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to see that how through the act of receiving communion, mm -hmm. I am literally, physically, spiritually, and in every way participating in the once for all saving action of Jesus Christ. How am I washed in the blood of the Lamb? We used to say that all the time. We used to sing a song. Sing song. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? The soul cleansing blood of the Lamb. How does that happen? By our participation in the Holy Eucharist. Okay. No, no, you're of us. You are come from a tradition that's closest to, and sometimes that's the hardest puddle to jump over mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it's so close. Yeah. Um, I know that uh, I'd like to say these things about my own conversion because I think they're like so many others, is when you read these scriptures and you take them at face value because you've not been taught not to as you have, mm -hmm. you then get confronted with the reality that your pastor of your church cannot mm 
bring about the transformation of the bread and wine to the body and blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. So you are confronted with something that is not the reality that is being spoken of. And so when you look for its effect on you, it has none. Because all it is is bread. Right. And you get, go away confused. The words may burn in your heart. I know myself, when I saw that they took the bread and ate it, and then they knew it was him, oh. which means that the bodily presence, the familiar presence the disciples had with him before resurrection, is not the means by which we know him best. We know him when he dwells in us by the reception of his body and blood, that, uh, the body and blood as is the case here in the Emmaus Road story. We have this more intimate connection that allows us to know him in the way that these science fiction movies always talk about somebody entering a person's body and knowing what they really were thinking, being able to really discern their thoughts. That's what you're able to do. So after having had that event in that uh, Disciples of Christ library across from the University of Kentucky in Lexington, Kentucky, I then went back to my the seminary, Asbury Seminary, to the chapel thinking I was going to hear a good sermon because the new president was coming who was quite intellectual. <laughs> he chose as his text this very text. Mm. And he spoke about it in the typical Methodist ways. And they passed around a little cup and a little cracker. I remember when they put it in my hand, I thought, what is this? <laughs> I remember taking him and putting him down on the seat and walking out because I knew that that was not the case. That that was not, and then by a special grace, when I eventually decided to become Lutheran, we're receiving Lutheran Church, the Lord said to me, just before I went forward, there were other Lutherans, said, Noah, ask me what you will. I said, Lord, how do I know what I need? You know what I need. I wouldn't dare ask say what I need. You know what I need. I went forward, and he, as he put what was non-consecrated bread on my lips, God provided a grace so that I received something that was like eternal life. I felt invulnerable. I felt like I could run and jump and fly. I felt invulnerable. It lasted for days. And then finally, when I was converted to the church, about two years later, it was over the Eucharist again, seeing that Bernadette received, this time it was really consecrated bread. It was really Jesus. I could see it when I had my conversation with her. She had, he had put it on her tongue. And I experienced the radiating, the real presence of Christ. We spoke earlier how that seeing Christ is only spiritually present makes you wonder how prayer at your bedside is different than prayer in the church. Mm -hmm. Catholics have the answer. This is really Jesus. Right. This really has causal powers like the presence because it is Jesus. So uh, he is here. So everyone here hearing this, believing these words because they haven't been persuaded of some other view that whitewashes them, they should go to their nearby Catholic church, set before the Blessed Sacrament, they need to do this repeatedly, and see the power of the presence of Christ mm -hmm. that will convert their soul to the mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. And that, that notion of the difference between your bedside prayer uni union with Christ and the union with Christ in the Eucharist was something that was poignantly uh, troubling to me, even though I couldn't articulate in those, in those in those ways. In my prayer life as a non-denominational Christian, um, I always wanted more. I wanted to go beyond that. I, mm -hmm. I felt there's a union here with Christ, but it's not everything it ought to be. I have a fuller capacity for this, yes. and I'm not reaching it. What is this? It wasn't until later that I realized it was a thirst for and, and hunger for the Eucharist um, that brought me that full union with Christ that I had always desired, that union to be with my Lord intimately, not only in a spiritual way, but manifested physically with him, that I receive all of him in the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And that reality has enhanced my spiritual life immensely, mm -hmm. that I can come to the Lord in the Eucharist at the Mass, I can be united with him completely physically um, and spiritually, and, and that he can transform me from, from within because he comes to dwell in me as a bridegroom. Mm -hmm. There is this particular issue, there is so much we could talk about. Yeah quotes from the early church fathers. In fact, one book that I highly recommend, if you're interested in this, is a book called The Hidden Manna, mm -hmm. Great book. which is published by Ignatius Press, an excellent book that studies the history of the understanding of the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And it's an excellent book. And I'm just going to add a couple things because I mentioned earlier my embarrassing moment as a young pastor, right? I mean, imagine yourself there before your congregation, your, your first time doing the Lord's Supper, and you're standing there holding half of a loaf of bread, and the other half has broken off, hit the altar, and, and fallen down. And I'm a young pastor. Now, at the time, I was just embarrassed about me. I didn't have any of this understanding or even think about that in any way this was the real body and blood of Christ. It was a loaf of bread. 
because I believed he was spiritually present there and probably embarrassed of me at the moment. I moved on with the, the saying of the words of consecration from 1 Corinthians 11 at the time, continued on with, with the, the Lord's Supper. It was later, as I was struggling with all these interpretations of Scripture, the Bible is supposed to be sufficient to teach us what's true. But there were so many views on the Eucharist. And it was, in fact, in 1 Corinthians 11 that I became awakened to the problem that I was having as a pastor. Because I noticed that my Presbyterian book of worship, where I read the words for the communion, quoted directly from 1 Corinthians 11. The familiar words that we all hear. For I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and on and on with the words we hear every time we celebrate communion. Verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You've said that many, many times, Father, every day as a priest. But I noticed that the next couple of verses had been removed from my Presbyterian book of worship. And it bothered me. Why are we removing scriptures? Because we would jump and say something later, but we had removed these words. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But well, the point is that I recognize, why have we removed this from our worship? It has to do with the fact, and I went through this struggle, is that on the one hand, we believe that this was only spiritual. But Paul believed it was more. Right. Clearly. Mm -hmm. Clearly he believed it was more than spiritual. Mm -hmm. The Bible alone, understood literally, would point to something different than what I taught as a Presbyterian pastor. Mm -hmm. Now, at the time, that it just sent me out of the pastorate because the problem was me. I don't know how to interpret it. But later I would see, wait a second. Mm -hmm. Paul meant something more. Another verse that awakened me to this was one of my favorite passages that I love to preach from was John 15. Mm -hmm. The vine and the branches. The branches yeah. I am the vine, you are the branches. I preached through those first 11 verses in John 15 mm -hmm. a bazillion times. I loved them about abiding in Christ and producing fruit and all those good things. Of course, I taught that producing fruit was converts, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. not virtues. But the point was, then one time I recognized, well, if we're called to abide in Christ, mm -hmm. he says, abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Abiding in Christ was a necessity. That's right. Mm -hmm. We must abide. It's not a once saved, always saved. We must abide and remain. The word abide means remain. Well, what does it mean to abide? And that became a big issue for me, studying that, teaching on that. But where is the only one verse where Jesus clearly defines what it means to abide? Where is that guy? John chapter 6. There's one place where Jesus says, this is how you abide. He says, for my... It says, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up in the last day, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. We abide in Christ through the Eucharist. At the time, I didn't know what to deal with that. But thankfully, by God's grace, I listened to the authority that Christ gave us that preserved the tradition of understanding the meaning of the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. It didn't fit my physical senses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't early church fathers deal with that issue about what do we do with our physical senses and what we see versus what we believe. Right. So I don't know if any of you remember the quote from the early church fathers on, on the fact that we see it looks like bread, tastes like wine, but it is, in fact, the body and blood of Christ. It was an early struggle, but an affirmation of the real presence of Christ. I always think of Thomas Aquinas, yeah. who said, the only sense that you can trust is your hearing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because what do you hear? The body of Christ. 
the blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so it is only hearing that does not deceive, he says. Uh, yep. Yep. Let's talk about what the church, therefore, actually teaches about the Eucharist. Because mm -hmm. we know that even there are Catholics, possibly because of poor catechesis, that may not fully understand the meaning of the Eucharist in, in the Catholic right. Church. Right. Well, the Catholic Church believes that when the uh, Eucharist is uh, confected by a validly ordained priest of Jesus Christ, that what happens is what is called transubstantiation, that the very substance of the bread and wine, in other words, what the bread and wine is in itself, is changed, is transformed into the very real body and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The only thing that remains of the bread and wine would be the appearances, the outer appearances. But what the bread and wine is, its very substance, is transformed. Sometimes people struggle with this, um, and it is a mystery indeed, but my question is always this, especially when I'm talking to, to well, sometimes when I'm talking to Catholics and sometimes when I'm talking to non-Catholics, I say, well, do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Well, of course I do. Mm -hmm. Well, why is it that you can believe that he rose from the dead, a physical impossibility, mm -hmm. and yet you don't believe that he can transform bread and wine into his body and blood? Mm -hmm. uh, do you believe that he touched blinded eyes and restored sight? Of course I do. Well, if, if, if you, and, and, it, and to me it all gets down to, do I believe in the divinity of the Lord Jesus? Mm -hmm. If we believe that Jesus is God, then as God, he most certainly has the power to take a piece of bread in his, wine, in his hand and say, this is my body. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the same people that can't believe in transubstantiation believe that God created ex nihilo. That's right. God and created from nothing. the word. Somehow God existed before every, anything else mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and created from nothing all that we see. Well, if he can do that, Right. Mm -hmm. the, the, dif the difficulty is that many times people try to approach the Eucharist from a purely intellectual uh, direction. The Eucharist ultimately can only be apprehended by faith. Faith is required. Mm -hmm. and, and a faith in the person of Jesus, a faith in the person of Jesus, to take him at his word. And that's why many of the church fathers, whenever they had to reaffirm what the church had always, had always taught on Eucharist, it always sprang forth from a controversy about who Christ was, That's right. about the person of Christ. The, the, the early apostolic fathers all fought against Gnosticism and Docetism, which mm -hmm. wanted to change Christ in something other than who he was. And then the, the Nestorians and the Arians, the, mm -hmm. the same thing, that whenever those things arose, there was a transition in what those people believed about the Eucharist. And the, and the fathers had to reaffirm, this is what we've always believed about the Eucharist, that it is the body and blood of Christ, that, that those elements are transformed to be something beyond what they were before right. and to bring us in union with Christ. One should bear in mind that when the apostles first heard these words from Jesus, they didn't see anything. The, it would still look like bread, it still looked like wine. They saw the physical Jesus in front of them. They may not have had any greater idea about how than the person who's hearing us, who wondering, is it the body and blood of Jesus Christ? It is the case that after the resurrection, and we get in the book of Acts, we found that they, their ex the Eucharist corresponded to their experience of Jesus. Mm -hmm. That yes, I start out by faith, but after years of receiving Jesus mm -hmm. faithfully, after years of being before him in adoration, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. see that effect has taken place in myself that I can't account for in any other way That's except right. that this is really Jesus. Right. So we start out by faith like the apostles on that night, and like them we travel through Acts and we come to have the experience where Jesus says, this is the manna that sustains you to heaven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would also suggest to anyone who is not Catholic or maybe to a Catholic who is having doubts about the Eucharist to please go to a Catholic church where the Eucharist is kept in the tabernacle and just sit there. Yes. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the things that converted me as a Baptist was that I started coming by this very network. I lived very close to here. I started coming by this network and sitting in that chapel. Mm 
even though I didn't fully understand what was going on there, I thought, well, they believe the Lord is there. And so I just said, Lord, if you're there, I want you to convince me that you're there. <laughs> and, and it was in that chapel that I had the experience of reading John 6 that I described earlier. And so I would encourage people to find a Catholic church and just go to the Lord who is there and just wait with him. Wait with we him. mentioned that in some of our traditions that there were closed tables mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. Well, there is a closed table in the Catholic Church when it comes to the Eucharist. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Well, the whole idea of communion. Going to communion in the Catholic Church is a public profession. It's a way of saying, I am in union with this church. I am one with this church in belief. Mm -hmm. And so, in a certain sense, to go to communion and not be in union with the church is really sort of an act of hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's why even when I preach to my own people as a Catholic priest, I want them to understand how important the act yeah. of communion is, that it's not just, we're not just going through the motions, mm -hmm. that what is required is a real commitment. Mm -hmm. I once heard an apologist say that going for, for someone who is not Catholic to go to communion is akin to sex outside of marriage. That you, 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 what is required in order to receive the Eucharist is the commitment. And it's the same with the act of love between a husband and wife. What is required to enter into an act of love is the commitment of marriage. What is required to enter into the banquet of Christ's love in communion with the church is a commitment mm -hmm. to his church. And that commitment is, is even just to make, is deeper than merely I love you and you love me right. and we're oh, committed to hold together. Beyond. We're talking about we are sons and daughters That's right. in the family of God by baptism, by the graces of the sacrament. And that's why we receive him in the Eucharist. That's right. In this very unique way. As John says in 1 John, it's a fellowship that we share with one another and with the Father. Mm -hmm. And there's also a very real spiritual danger, as you read from 1 Corinthians 11, yeah. to receive the body without discerning the reality there can be spiritually and even physically dangerous. One of the things that I'd like to add as well is that only a consecrated priest uh, in the order starting from the, the Holy Father, we accept the Orthodox Brethren, uh, can bring about the transformation of the bread and wine of the body and blood of Christ. You need to know that that individual is connected to that genealogy, if you will, from the Holy Father, or else you end up with just bread and wine that have no power to give you what Christ promised. And so you should go away disappointed after years of being exposed and to And the it. reason that genealogy goes back, genealogy, yeah. to the Holy Father is because he had hands laid on him of another apostolic right. man who received it from the apostles, yes. who received it from Christ. It is this long-standing connection mm -hmm. of the graces of the body and blood of Because Christ, as Father Christ Bean said himself. earlier, if a person does the acts of worship before what they think is a cons consecrated bread and wine and it is not, it's an act of idolatry materially. Yeah. You know, the person doesn't know it's not, but we want to safeguard acts of worship before God and not have you do acts of worship before something that may not be God because they're really not a Catholic priest. Ignatius of Antioch said the only legitimate Eucharist is one in union with the bishop. Right. That's right. Well, thank you all for joining us. Father, could we have a blessing? Absolutely. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, descend upon you now and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. I do want to remind the audience that uh, obviously because of time we can't cover every angle on these discussions. Uh, so I once again would like to recommend to you the compendium of the Catholic Church recently released a very succinct description of what Catholics believe on, of course, all the essential subjects, but particularly on this issue of the Eucharist to understand what we really believe, not what maybe a neighbor says doesn't have either uh, the clear teaching or wants to be charitable and water it down. I think about that when we hear the anger of those that are angry because they can't be received into communion to receive, they think it's uncharitable. Well, the truth is, it is an issue of charity that we have a closed altar because we want people to have the fullness of Christ. 
not a misunderstanding or only a fraction or a part of. We want them to have the fullness of the truth. So thank you, Noah and Sean and Father Bean for joining us on this special edition of The Journey Home. Thank you for joining us. Our prayers for you are taste and see the beauty of the Lord, the fullness of the faith of Christ in his church and through the graces of the sacraments by which he draws us closer to him. God bless you. See you again soon.